Greetings, friends. My name is Jessa McLean, and I'm here to provide you with some blueprints of disruption. This weekly podcast is dedicated to amplifying the work of activists, examining power structures, and sharing the success stories from the grassroots. Through these discussions, we hope to provide folks with the tools and the inspiration they need to start to dismantle capitalism, decolonize our spaces, and bring about the political revolution that we know we need. All right, a little while back, there was a tweet that really set me off. And I've never started an episode like this, but I'm going to read out my response to that tweet and then explain everything. The more I think on this, the more it pisses me off. Not only do the NDP fail on delivering socialist solutions, but they are playing right into the right's narrative of socialism being nothing but handouts. This kind of messaging is setting us back. And that's all the NDP really does anymore. They soak up our funds, our energy, our hopes, and with all those resources, they are de-radicalizing the left. They are erasing socialism from the Canadian political spectrum. And many of us are aiding this demise out of fear. The worst part of that fear of having a conservative government for years has allowed progressives across Canada to settle for less and lesser. Until all we've been left with is orange liberals who we also can't trust with power. And while we prop up the next best choice, we've lost sight of the ideal. Many are losing hope as they see fascism rise with no real response from those tasked with stopping it. Worse, those people... They play into the narratives of capitalism and of the right. The NDP for years have been unwilling to step into the unknown and advocate for a political revolution. But their cowardly idleness hasn't just failed us. They have sold us out and adopted the language and approaches of our opponents. I sent out that response to a tweet sent by NDP MP Blake Desjardins. He was describing corporate bailouts as socialism for the super rich. Now, in no way am I implying that Blake is responsible for the downfall of the NDP. I probably read that tweet on a bad day or whatever, and it just set me off. But I think it's just terribly demonstrative of what has really been eating away at me in terms of the NDP. Not only did that tweet... clearly misrepresent socialism, right? Casting it in a very bad light. It described the neoliberal capitalist hellscape we're in as rugged. Rugged individualism was the term he used. He goes on further to suggest that socialism means blank checks, right? Using the language of our opponents to denigrate socialism, playing into their tropes that, you know, socialism is nothing but free shit. And maybe he did all of this without knowing it. I don't know, but my initial response was, if they don't even know what socialism is, how can they ever fight for it? The truth is, they don't want to fight for it. And they are the ones largely responsible for trying to erase socialism from the Canadian political spectrum. And I'm going to break that down completely in this episode and explain why we just can't, you know, shake our head at their decisions, disagree with it, try to petition them to do better, and then just go on with our way. Why do I hold the NDP so explicitly responsible for this, you know, shift to the right of the entire Overton window? It's because no other political entity has the spotlight, the platform, the resources that political parties do. And if you're talking about the left in Canada, you're talking about the NDP. Not even union federations get the media attention or the resources, the free labor that comes with a political party. And surely there are no grassroots organizations that have that same kind of reach. So in large part, if there is alternatives to be presented, political alternatives, policy alternatives, if they're going to gain any traction, they need to be brought up in the House, in the legislature, right? That's the reality. That's what a lot of the groups that we have brought on the show have spent their energies doing, even if they're not directly working within these partisan circles, much of their time and energy is spent lobbying 
either those in power, those in proxy to power, trying to find heroes within the legislature to champion their cause. And very few of us have gotten very far with that approach. And, you know, we do have a Green Party in Canada and in some provinces, one can argue, you know, surely in Alberta, one can argue that they are, you know, left of the NDP on the spectrum. There's still really no arguing that largely across Canada, the NDP siphons much of their energy from the progressives in this country. Right. And that includes a large contingent of socialists, many who have become disillusioned and walked away but many still remain within the party, desperate for something better. And all of these people are already stretched very thin. We may have local groups that we can organize with on top of donating our time and money to the NDP, but there's not many people that have that kind of spare time. Most people are struggling financially, emotionally, mentally with their time, with their resources. And so... By holding the beacon that it does, almost this false beacon that they do, they're taking those resources from actual causes and actual movements, genuine movements that do hold the values of socialism, that do lift up the people around you. We demonstrate them on Blueprints of Disruption almost every episode. Whatever it is we have now in the NDP, there's no disputing that it was largely built off the principles of socialism when it was formed back in 1961. I mean, its first leader, Tommy Douglas, had already been elected as premier under a socialist government. Whatever our history is, there's ample evidence that those principles have completely vanished from the current form of the NDP, not organically, but by design. The decisions by top party brass are well documented, especially in Matt Fodor's book, From Leighton to Sing. It's Subtitle is the 20-year conflict behind the NDP's deal with the Trudeau Liberals, but it had previously been titled, and I think largely more appropriate for us, the 20-year struggle for the NDP's soul. And essentially, we lost that struggle. If you want to hear more about Matt's book and the strategical decisions and who made them, you can go back to our episode, Deliberate Turn to Center. What it really represents, though, is a very narrow vision of what is electable. And it's all been done at the expense of the enthusiasm and hopefulness of the base. Now, a lot of people will argue that the strategy that the NDP employs and has been employing since Jack Layton is an attempt to win power. You know, that these are necessary evils that we participate in, a Machiavellian approach of having to play political games in order to win, and you can't change anything without being in power, is a really narrow vision of what politics is. And it completely ignores where we need to make gains, right? In the massive amount of people that have completely disengaged from politics altogether. And I think it's safe to say that Even if this is a strategical position to take, a centrist position under the guise that it's more appealing, I think we have evidence to show that it's not a ploy just to get elected because we've seen what they do with power. One needs to just look at the Alberta NDP under Rachel Notley and even her current campaign now. I mean, we're talking about almost zero intervention in terms of housing, their oil sands apologists condemning activists fighting for health care, saying those aren't the real issues facing people right now. Obviously, I'm going to mention BC NDP, you know, their current premier. He openly admits he's no activist anymore. And their last leader joins the board of a coal company. And, you know, even with a majority government for a few years, their minimum wage just barely eked out Ontario, who've been ruled by Ford Nation for five years, you know conservatives openly hostile to workers, yet there's no real huge chasm between these two. So how did the NDP, a party founded on socialist ideals, funded and founded by people with very progressive solutions to the problems that we face under capitalism, how did that become what we see today? How did so many members allow this to happen? I'm going to go through that. In terms of the lack of action against what the party's become, there's a real fear of the alternative. People don't want conservative government. Most of us also don't want a liberal government either. So we're not really left with a whole other choices. 
it would be fun to imagine what we would have if we did have a true socialist alternative, though. I spoke to a, an activist from Toronto just the other day, and they said something along the lines like, if we did have a socialist option at the ballot, you know, to put our energies into, that we would quickly see who our allies and who our enemies were within the NDP, right? If we actually provided an avenue for folks to fight for what they believe in, because there are good people in that party that do believe in socialist solutions, you know, democratic workspaces, public and free transit and education, healthcare, you name it, you know, but they have been marginalized by the system that they're working within. You know, what if we gave them that avenue? We've talked a little bit about why we think the NDP have moved to center, but I'm going to break down exactly how they're doing it, right? Where the evidence sits. And it's not just in, you know, removing the word socialism from their policy book. They try to remove actual socialists as well, right? They do this using fear and manipulation and a terribly authoritarian approach, Right, completely at odds with the values that founded the party and the values that drive most of its members. And we've documented many of these on our show, right? From the way that they vet candidates and try to weed out any radical socialists from even running for the party, right? We wouldn't want to give them that kind of platform. And they've used many, many different forms of manipulation and anti democratic processes to do that, right? Many, many times over. We did it our our episode, Candidate Crisis, is entirely about that. They also muzzle the elected. We have had testimony from former MPs and MPPs on how they felt that they were put in a penalty box within the party, how they were censored. We've seen Nikki Ashton and Sarah Jama, two women that are open socialists and do advocate for very radical progressive solutions be marginalized within the party. They also do this by controlling the kinds of discussions people have at convention. We just finished a live stream last week called Controlling Conventions and documented how anti-democratic, how orchestrated and manipulated the approach is to what policies can be discussed on convention floor. They do whatever it takes to make sure that the most socialist, the most progressive solutions are never even discussed and never the most controversial. But you know, with a lot of effort, some people have been successful in these spaces in bringing certain topics to the floor, you know, with incredible efforts. And the result is it never sees the light of day. Something in the policy book does not necessarily come out of the mouths of any of our leaders. So they control the spaces in which people can have the discussions, but in the end, it doesn't matter. They are often short lived. That's where the discussion ends, right? And this is all because it's completely structured like a pyramid where unelected party brass actually make the decisions that are now, as we're seeing, impact the con entire Canadian politics. During the live stream controlling conventions, one of the testimonies from someone who had been involved with trying to make convention more accessible to members was that they felt like they were sticking their necks out. And that speaks to how a lot of activists within the party feel, right? This is how they control the fringes of the party using that fear of reprisal. They're very vindictive, right? We all know that I was removed from the party for being openly critical of the leaders, right? So they will actually literally remove socialists from the party or use other tactics to make them feel unwelcome. And, you know, partisans really play into this, right? They really play into this, you can't say anything bad about us or you're helping the enemy kind of mentality that, uh, you know, helps people work against their comrades, to be honest. How they choose their next leaders is another way that the NDP makes sure that socialism doesn't take root in what actually comes out of the party. We all remember what happened in BC. We did an episode called, you know, the BC NDP fear of their eco-socialist roots and the lengths that they went through to make sure the succession of John Horgan would be da David Eby. Right, that the momentum that the Epidure campaign gathered that was predominantly socialists terrified them to the point where they quite openly 
in my opinion, manipulated the process without any fear of what that would look like, because I think the fear of looking like a communist party outranked that. Right? They were willing to really get dirty on that one and do whatever it took to make sure that there would be no real meaningful ideological change within the party in B.C., Ontario's leadership race, there was none. And again, that was largely in part by the want to maintain the status quo, to have an, a near identical replacement to Andrea Horwath, and to make sure that the more radical MPPs within the party didn't challenge that. They also took significant steps to make sure that the leadership isn't accessible to your average person, right? We have huge monetary requirements and other, you know, loop, hoops to jump through. And again, like a pyramid, all of it comes back to a single position within the party. This authoritarian approach is often conducted by a director position. We document that all again, a lot in the live stream that we did last week, but people would be shocked to know how much one person holds sway over a party that includes democratic in its name, because it's anything but those directors and those consultants that aren't elected within the party that are paid quite handsomely, they also get to decide what the party is going to use this incredible platform for, what their messaging is going to be, what they're going to advocate for, right? What they're going to make space for. And what they're doing is actually advocating for capitalist solutions, neoliberal solutions, more police, more pipelines, that should make a lot of people very angry. And we've had a litmus test for this, haven't we? One that told us that this approach is not working, not even in Alberta, where Notley's campaign had real right-wing elements to it, including a promise not to tax small businesses and, you know, your basic climate denial. They lost, even though they've convinced themselves in true NDP fashion that this was some sort of win, but unfortunately that means... That's likely their strategy moving forward. Along with coming up with really bad policy ideas that capitulate so much to capital, they use the biggest platform they have to do the same. And this matters, right? Social media matters. I went on about a single tweet, but let's be honest, these days most people are forming their political opinions from social media. And not even online will the NDP dare to dream. No. Blair's tweet earlier was just one of many opportunities lost. We've had to endure Jagmeet's praise of President Biden, completely absent of any critical analysis, just some good old-fashioned bootlicking. And this doesn't exactly differentiate them from the liberals who hosted Hillary Clinton at their latest convention. Trying to argue that these two parties will produce different results has become almost impossible at this point. One of my favorites from Jagmeet, and they've kept repeating this one. They seem to like it. Workers deserve a home they can afford. And, you know, most folks would hear that and say, sure, of course. But let me tell you why that messaging sucks. Housing is a human right. A lot of people have put in a lot of work to help guarantee that and to center that very specific messaging. The UN even says so, you know. And the NDP knows this. The people writing their comms know this. And yet here they are saying housing is dependent on your ability to work, on your ability to pay. Now, we know the party's history with erasing disabled folks from the discussion. So this isn't exactly a surprise. But what about them? What do people who can't work get? Something they can't afford? Nothing? Homelessness? Everyone deserves a home, full stop. And, you know, some of us talk about decommodifying housing altogether, but not one political entity is on our side. That is unacceptable considering the roots of the party. At the height of the pandemic, when essential supplies were low and our healthcare was collapsing, this was the perfect time to use that platform to harness the angst that so many people obviously feel. Because we've seen the right capture this mood of the public in the most harmful ways imaginable, while the left is taking that platform of millions and using made-up words like greedflation, instead of heading straight into it and helping people get to where they need to politically. We needed anti-capitalist messaging loud and clear. Instead, we got calls for more competition. 
how can a working class party not advocate for the nationalization of telecoms in the current state of things? How are Canadians going to get to a place to consider these options if no one in any kind of position of authority dares to even suggest them on their TikTok feed? We pay almost the highest internet and cell phone rates in the world and have left control of one of the most important pieces of infrastructure in private hands. And the NDP's only solution is to add more private companies into the mix. These aren't just lost chances at providing real alternatives either, you know, alternatives for people to chew on. It's the established left using what resources they have that you gave them to undermine our work, to take steps backward in our advocacy. There was one glaring example that really demonstrated the right's knack for populism versus the NDP's desire to appear more moderate, to avoid the dreaded label of communist. (laughs) I mean, something that Trudeau has been called, for heaven's sake, There is no avoiding that label. But during a most critical election in Ontario, one in which the NDP had been the official opposition during very dark days under Doug Ford and his so-called progressive conservatives, the leader of the Workers' Party repeated this line that small businesses are the backbone of the economy. And obviously, people did not waste any time taking this and putting it next to a statement a recent statement from Doug Ford in which he rightfully acknowledged that, quote, workers are the backbone of the economy. Now, he doesn't actually believe this, and I have no idea what Merritt Stiles believes. I just know that if those are our two options, workers are in trouble. The party is so desperate to appeal to absolutely everyone and avoid being labeled radical that they've become almost nothing at all. They don't think it's their job to politicize Canadians. They're just going to ride the wave wherever it takes them, as long as they can keep the lights on at the Jack Layton building in Ottawa. But another reason that their tweets and their TikToks and their Facebook posts are so important is because these days, one of the biggest platforms a party has is their social media. So perhaps that's why that tweet set me off in the way that it did is because I know how many people use social media to form their political opinions. So if you're just cheering for, you know, electoral wins and being able to say that your party won, maybe a centrist approach is is a short term win for you. But if you're an actual socialist and you know what's at stake and you know how much time is left, whether or not you agree with the strategy they're using We have to acknowledge that this move has changed the political landscape as much as the far right has. In fact, one can argue that it's the failure to, at the very least, hold the left that has made room for fascism to rear its ugly head again. Because the impact of the electability of the NDP goes far beyond the party and its ability to gain power. This strategy is harmful because it's erasing socialism from the spectrum. It's eroding people's hope of what can be possible, even people who had already been advocating for more, for better. They've been convinced by the left that that just isn't possible. It's not plausible. It's, it's not going to happen. That has a huge impact on people's psyche and their ability to you know, put out good work. They're essentially de-radicalizing a lot of people on the left. Some of us are railing against it, have broken free, you know, refused to accept this reality. But that's not everybody. And that's a huge loss. The strategy is also shifting the whole spectrum, right? That means making more room for farther and farther right solutions. Bad solutions. (laughs) Harmful solutions that will kill people. That are killing people. We are normalizing that. We are. Just as much as the people harnessing the hatred that exists, we failed to harness the hopefulness that should have existed. Right? The strategy is also just completely ignoring the 60% out of people who just don't vote anymore. They don't see a reason to. They can't find time to. It's, they're not inspired enough Right. If we don't draw them back into politics, the right will. And instead, we're focusing on the people who are already engaged and trying to placate to them. 
And the result of all of that is we are inspiring no one, even when we win power, right? Worse, sometimes when we win power, those provincial examples that we have are giving people a lot of cause for pause. I said this as we signed off from our Controlling Conventions live stream last week. The more fuel we provide for this machine, this institution that is actually damaging our political potential, then we are partly responsible for the struggle that we're going to face as a result. There needs to be a united socialist movement in Canada, one outside the reach and influence of the NDP. We need to continue to make space for ideas like nationalized industries, democratic workplaces, free and public transit, education, health care, and anything else you need to survive, frankly, including international solidarity. We must break free of the stranglehold the NDP has on progressives in Canada and find a vehicle that will take us there together. Without having to continue to make concessions, we may never get back. We once did an episode where we talked about partisan spaces and we called it Wasted Energy. That was way too passive of a title. After I've had time to reflect, this is one year into our show. And the more that I do this, the more I am convinced that the NDP are actually a a detriment to our movement. They are what's standing in the way of the political revolution, not the rise of the right. I know some of you are going to listen to this and absolutely shake your heads and not heed my advice, right? You still hold hope that there there is room for change in the party, that, that electoral politics cannot be abandoned entirely. To you, I say, if you are absolutely determined to go into these spaces, make sure that you don't hold back. Do not confine yourself to the mechanisms that they have in place because the powers that be are actually working against you. Emotional appeals, Robert's rules will not reform that party. No matter how many members or EDA presidents you get to sign a petition that will not change that party. That party needs a fire from within or you need to burn it down. That is a wrap on another episode of Blueprints of Disruption. Thank you for joining us. Also, a very big thank you to the producer of our show, Santiago Halu Quintero. Blueprints of Disruption is an independent production operated cooperatively. You can follow us on Twitter at BP of Disruption. If you'd like to help us continue disrupting the status quo, please share our content. And if you have the means, consider becoming a patron. Not only does our support come from the progressive community, so does our content. So reach out to us and let us know what or who we should be amplifying. So until next time, keep disrupting.